Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second service today at Grace Church, and we're glad you guys are online. Out there, we're on radio right now across the country, live. You guys don't know, but we are we have people in 77 different stations listening to us right now uh, across the country. But more important than all of that, God's listening to you. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what, what I love about the Lord, he, he invades our lives. He does. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all come and make home within our hearts. And so when, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come, I don't know if you've had a chance to do that today, if you, have you even thought about it, but you know, for the Holy Spirit to be present with us, but the Holy Spirit to be upon us, and even be beyond being upon each one of us, for, for the Holy Spirit to come to this room. Amen. You say, well, he can't do that. Oh, yeah. Well, yes, he can. <laughs> Just like Jesus, the Holy Spirit goes where he's welcomed. He, he goes where he's welcome. Remember, you know, when Jesus knocks on the door, well, open the door, let the Lord Jesus in. He's knocking on the door of his church in Revelation chapter 3. Hey, wouldn't it be horrendous if somewhere we did invite the presence of Jesus to come in? And we just assume, don't we assume, well, well two or three are gathered there. Listen, listen, we need to invite him. And the same with the Holy Spirit, that we get to, you say, well, I've got the Holy Spirit, I'm sealed. Well, I'm glad you are, but does the Holy Spirit have you? Amen. And that we, we together can come together and invite the presence of the Lord for Jesus to move amongst us and for the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know, he wants to. He does. So I'm going to invite him. Uh, Robert, thank you for reading that portion of Scripture. Matter of fact, you said, well, why are we talking so much about the Holy Spirit? Well, we're going through 1 John, and John is going to make a big deal about the Holy Spirit right where we left off last week. And you might say, well, I don't remember him saying he hasn't said anything yet. But, but that's why you, you want to right now get your Bible, get your Bible, and open your Bible up with me. It's on page 1498, 1498, and you want to find 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. And, and you really want to do this because I've told you over and over again, do not trust a preacher. Do not trust me. And you say, why? Because there's a whole bunch of us that are false preachers. We are false prophets. And you say, why are you picking on that? Welcome to the sermon today. Amen. We're going to talk about the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, and the spirit of error. We're going to talk about false prophets everywhere. And they're telling you a bunch of junk about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. The Bible will always tell you the truth. I, I guess I jumped right into the sermon there. So did I, did I tell you happy or glad you're here and have a nice day? I'm Pastor Bill. If you're a visitor here today, I'm so glad you came. If you're online with us for the first time, I'm so glad. Because you know what? My, my job is just to tell you the truth. My job is not to say, well, just believe me. Don't ever just believe a preacher because he says, just believe me. Don't do that. Well, I had a dream. Don't believe a preacher because he had a dream. He might have got that from Taco Bell and too much hot sauce. <laughs> hey, be careful of this one. Well, I had a vision. Okay, great. Great. I had a vision and I've got a prophecy. Listen, I, I, can, I believe that can happen, but it will never contradict his word. It will never contradict his word. Matter of fact, any vision, any prophecy, any special word from God will always confirm what he's already said. Amen. So don't hear me saying, no, I don't want that. I'm just saying, when you listen to somebody, I don't care if they're on radio, if they're on TV, and if they're standing here, they would better be telling you the truth. And you say, well, how will we know? <laughs> you got your Bible. 
Now be careful for the, of the guys that want to flip around and, and try to make the Bible say what they want it to say. I'm just walking through 1 John. So you guys can all examine me with what the sermon is today based on what your Bible says. By the way, my job is not to convince you. Did you know that? I'm not trying to convince you. My job is just to tell you what the Bible says. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Amen. And if you don't listen to him, well, ooh. So just check me out. But that's why I say you really want to see this in your Bible. Because we're living during the time of the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist. That's been true for 2,000 years. But man, it's taken off. Have you noticed that everybody's lying to everybody about everything? Have you noticed that? Well, not, not my political body. Everybody's lying to everybody about everything. Here's the problem. They don't even know they're lying. Everybody's lying. Now, some of them do, but a lot of them, they think they're telling the truth. Well, how do we know? Oh, here's the bigger one for you. Did you know that you lie to yourself all the time? You lie to you. Because you believe something that's not even true. And then somehow you think that, oh, nobody knows. Listen, listen, listen. God just wants to tell you the truth. You say, well, how's he going to do that? Can I, can I remind you that Jesus Christ is the truth? Amen. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So one, one that you can trust wholeheartedly is Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't trust a preacher. Trust Jesus Christ. He's the truth. And then Jesus, from John, he, he said in chapter 17, verse 17, thy word is truth, sanctify them in truth. You can trust your Bible. Well, I still got questions. Well, I'm glad you got questions, but you can trust your Bible. By the way, your Bible was written to read like any other book. Just read it. But ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you because he's the spirit of truth. Somebody ought to preach a sermon on this. <laughs> that, that's what happens. We left off last week in 323. We pick up this week, and guess what? John wants you to know about the spirit of truth. He wants you to personally know so that you can survive another week. Amen. Matter of fact, more than surviving, he wants you to thrive. Amen. This next week, you personally he wants you to be an overcomer when everybody else is tubing out. He wants you to be an overcomer. And you say, well, those are great words. Where'd you get them? Huh? The sermon. Watch. Look at where we left off last week. If I said the commandment, the commandment. Look at chapter 3 and verse 23. Thank you, Robert, for reading this. In chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Remember with me, Jesus Christ is not his name. His name is Jesus Christ, Messiah, anointed one. He's God in the flesh. Amen. He's God. Amen. That we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he also gave us commandment. And you guys remember that, right? So there's one command. Would you just believe the son? Would you believe on my son? Would you believe what he did? Would you trust him? If you do, then you're going to start loving each other. So the two are really like one command to love one another the way I've loved you. But if you come to me and I change your heart, you're going to love one another. You got that, right? That's all review. So what's the proof? You, hey, can I see Guzik what he says about belief? Make sure your belief is biblical belief. Biblical belief. This is not simply believing that Jesus is or even believing that he did certain things such as die on the cross. Well, no. To believe on the name of Jesus means to put your belief on Jesus in the sense of trusting, trusting in him, relying on him, clinging to Jesus. This isn't about intellectual knowledge or understanding. It's about trust. Amen. By the way, do you believe the chair you're sitting in? I know you do because you're sitting there. You trusted when you came in that if you sat in that chair, you wouldn't be sitting on the floor. Well, guess what? Your faith in the chair, your trust in the chair, you don't have to start clinging, but you get the idea, right? You are completely, that, that's what it is to believe on Jesus. I completely sit down, I settle down, I completely trust Amen. Jesus. What he did on the cross for me, that God the Father sent him because God the Father loves me. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Well, how can God die? God can't die. That's why he had to become a man. He's the God man who died for you. He's Jesus 
Christ. And you have to believe on him. You say, well, I think I do. Well, if you thought about that with a chair, you'd still be standing. Don't be standing on Jesus. You sit down, you believe in him, you trust him. And then something happens when you do that. It's, this is not shown up in 1 John. I know we know it from the Gospel of John, but 1 John has not talked about this at all yet. But notice what happens, God's presence, God's presence. When we keep that command to believe in him, then, then we find out all of a sudden, verse 24 now, he who keeps his commandments to believe and to love abides in him. We live, we dwell, we remain in him. And he in him. John hasn't said that yet. Not in 1 John. Did you know when you believe in Jesus, when you are in Jesus, then all of a sudden God's in you? Amen. That's what that says. Matter of fact, it says, and by this we know that he abides in us. We know that he abides and dwells in us by the Spirit. Can I hear you say the Spirit? Spirit. Whom he's given to us. What, what are you talking about? When you believe on Jesus, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, something happens. All of a sudden, God invades your life. Amen. You say, God? Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's references to all three. But specifically, the Holy Spirit invades your life. The moment you believe, the Holy Spirit shows up. You didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. You didn't have to ask for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit just shows up. And it's like, who's talking to me? Who's, why is the Bible talking to me? What's going on? Guess what? Jesus Christ, the truth, when you say yes to him, he sends the spirit of truth that invades your life, seals you to the day of redemption. And then the word of God, which is the truth, 17, John 17, sanctify them in truth, thy word is true. All of a sudden, the Bible starts talking to you. And you say, what is that? Truth. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the word of God. You have truth. It doesn't just contain truth. It's true. Jesus is true. The Holy Spirit's true. And when everybody's lying to everybody, including you to yourself, you can go to the truth, in the truth, abiding in the truth, the Holy Spirit. And guess what? You'll know the truth. Amen. You say, nobody else knows it. I know they don't know it. But you'll get to go back into your life, your marriage, your job, your school, your Monday. I don't know what your Monday is. You'll get to go back into Monday with truth. Amen. Empowered as an overcomer. Yeah. Yeah. Another way of saying victorious over all the lies. You say, where'd you get that? I read ahead. <laughs> John 4, 4. We're going to get there. First John 4, 4. Jump ahead with me. And we'll cover all the stuff in between. First John 4, 4. Now you... You, that's emphatic in the Greek. You, Grace Church, first or second service. You are of God, little children. We're not of the Antichrist. We're not of the false prophet. You are of God, little children, and have overcome. Can I hear you say overcome? overcome. You guys can say that better. Overcome. <laughs> you have overcome them, the false prophets, the liars, because he who is in you, Holy Spirit, is greater than he who's in the world. What are you saying? Greater is he who's in you than anybody in the world. Well, you don't know my husband. Greater is he who's in you. You don't know my boss. Greater is he who's in you. You don't know Putin. Greater is he who's in you than any false prophet, any liar, anybody on TV, any politician, even when you lie to yourself. Overcomers by the truth, not to survive another week, to thrive. Not that we have to go beat anybody up. I'm not talking about that. We just get to live in the victory of abiding in Christ as he abides in us by the power of his spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. Does he have you? You have a Bible. But does your Bible have you? You believe in Jesus. 
Do you love him more today than you ever have before? Amen. Welcome to the sermon, overcomers. Father, thank you for your word today. I pray that you would bless not just my words, but even the inflection of my voice. What wonderful truth, Lord, in a world upside down, literally going to hell, you've saved us by your grace with your son. You've given us all of what we need to know with the word of God. And on top, you've given us the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter. He should be our best friend. Oh, how we need the Holy Spirit today. I pray that, Lord Jesus, we would welcome you here and that we would welcome the Holy Spirit to anoint us, to fill us, to come. And if there's any that need conviction, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do that work of salvation that always starts with conviction. And then faith, I pray that you would give us faith. And then the ones that are saved, Lord, that we would have your encouragement as well as the adjustments and the fullness as we live in a world going crazy that we would see we're already overcomers by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we would be pleased for him just to come and anoint us. We welcome the Holy Spirit. Speak to us through your word. It's in the name of Jesus. God's people would say, I got some good news for you. We found Bigfoot. We found Bigfoot. I want to go find my neighbor because my neighbor's got a Bigfoot metal thing in his front yard and, and tell him that we actually have found Bigfoot. Matter of fact, he's not on top of a mountain. He's not in Idaho or Oregon. Uh, Bigfoot, believe it or not, Bigfoot, I've got pictures. I got pictures. Bigfoot is at the bottom of the ocean. You don't believe me, do you? I guess I should back that up, but hold on a second. Let me tell you, let me tell you how deep the ocean is before I show you where Bigfoot's at. We got the normal ocean, and then we got the deep ocean, but then you got the Mariana Strait. Did you know that's the, the lowest point on planet Earth? It's 37,000. Let me tell you again. 37, over seven miles from uh, the top of the ocean to the bottom of where that's at. It's the lowest point on planet Earth. There's no light down there. There's no, well, we would think, you know, scientists would say, well, there's nothing down there. Don't tell God Bigfoot lives there. <laughs> well, finally, we were able to get enough submarines and things together. They went down there and looked. And sure enough, they named this Yeti. I didn't name it, scientists said, this is the Yeti crab. Can I see a picture of the Yeti crab? There it is. They named it, they named it after Bigfoot. But that's a real deal. Did you know where, where Yeti lives? Up here right now, there's about 15 pounds of pressure, atmospheric pressure against you, about 15 pounds. When you go 37,000 feet below the ocean, it's over 16,000 pounds per square inch of atmospheric pressure. 16,000 pounds. Do you know what happened to us if we went down to where Yeti lives? You would be the size of a golf ball, poof, because you can't take that kind of pressure. Not only, but did you know uh, Dumbo the octopus? I didn't name Dumbo, this is part of his name. Can I see Dumbo? Dumbo lives down there where there's over 16,000 pounds of pressure. I mean, that's 15,000 more than we have to put up with, or a thousand times more we have to put. And uh, uh, also, okay, if you don't believe in God, the next picture I have, I, I just want to talk. Get, I, I wouldn't believe this if I didn't have a picture, but you need to see the angler fish. It lives at the bottom of the trench. By the way, there's no light down there. So somehow God put a light bulb at the end of his fishing rod <laughs> to wave it up and down. I'm not, making, I'm not making it up. Now, in case you're here and you still believe in evolution, evolution would never come up with that. But God, in all of his creation, not only came up with that, but came up with you. Go figure. Oh, and then the deep sea jellyfish. Can I see that? The deep sea. And so delicate. 
down there where the pressure is like unbelievable. And that just floats around. Of course, the angler fish is trying to get whatever it can get. And then you've got the Yeti, you know, out there hiding in the woods. Down the cab. You got me. And you say, why should we believe this? Well, because somebody went and investigated. They figured it out. And then they built a submarine strong enough to where they went down. And when they got down there where they thought there would be nothing, they came up with, wow. Don't you want to have that happen with the word of God today? Because everybody's telling you what they think is true. Well, how do you know if it's true? How do you know? Well, I think it is. Well, why do you think that? See, God, God actually sent us, preserved us this book. But not just the Bible. Bible is true. But God gave us the Holy Spirit to confirm what it says here. And then as we see, it's all a relationship. And I mean, we actually experience that. But everybody else is lying to you. Like we've already seen here. Can, can we all, the problem that we all face, I mean, if we're just honest, I just read, the problem that we all have, there's many false prophets, there's the spirit of the Antichrist, and there's the spirit of error. It all comes out of chapter 4, 1, 3, and 6. We all face that. Right now, it was true when John wrote this, but right now there's many false prophets. There's a spirit of error, and there's also a spirit of antichrist, and they're all lying to you. They're lying to you all the time. And if we're not careful, we don't even know they're lying to us. I'm, I'm reading a book right now. John Mark Comer, Live No Lies, Live No Lies. And he's just pointing out, I don't want to, Spend all the time on the, He's just pointing out everybody's lying to you. The, the, the devil is the father of lies. So when he lies to whoever, and then they put that on Facebook and you believe it, well, guess what? If he lies to everybody about everything, after a while, the whole, everything's a lie. The only one that'll tell you the truth is Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and your word, the Bible. And did, can we not recognize Jesus warned you of this over and over and over again? And then the apostles wrote about it all through your New Testament. So I'm just going to pick up for a second here. John Mark Comer, uh, page 55 of this book, he said, I find Jesus' teachings on the devil and lies more plausible, insightful, and compelling than ever before. Jesus and the apostles warn us over and over again of the danger of the dangers of lies, deception, false doctrine, false teachers who are wolves. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. In one of his last teachings, Jesus warned his disciples, watch out, watch out, that no one deceives you. He then warned that the false prophets would deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most would grow cold pointing forward to the reality in which we now inhabit. The New Testament writers followed up Jesus' warning with upwards of 40 more warnings of deception, especially in areas of sexual immorality and false teaching. Here's just a few samples. Notice what your Bibles say in the New Testament. Do not be deceived. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Evildoers and imposters, excuse me, evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. Paul writes about those who exchange. They exchange the truth about God for a lie. And people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Jude. Jude warns about false teachers who have secretly slipped in amongst you, who pervert the grace of our God into license for immorality. In Revelation, the unholy trinity of the apocalypse are masters of disinformation. 
The false prophet and the Antichrist deceive and delude and lead astray the nations. The Satan himself deceives the whole world. Are you getting the picture? For Jesus and the early teachers of his way, deception was a major issue. Well, how do we counteract that? I mean, if you've been warned and warned and warned over and over, the gift of the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's what he's introducing us to this right now because he's going to address all these problems. But when he says right there at the end of chapter 3, and by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he's given to us. You realize how precious the Holy Spirit is, right? Amen. Are, are you able to recall? I, I took some time, and I just want to remind you that John here writing the epistle, remember what he said about the Holy Spirit, what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit? Jesus in chapter 14, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. I will pray to the Father. He will give you Another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth. Can I hear you say truth? truth? He's the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Amen. In John 14, 26, Jesus said, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. John 15, 26, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth. Can I hear you say truth? He's the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will testify of me. John 16, 12, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This is after the resurrection, just before uh, Pentecost. Acts 1, 8, Jesus said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Can I hear you say power? Power. Okay, one guy said it right. <laughs> Some of you didn't say anything. Here I'm trying to share with you the value of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said it's better for me to go to heaven and send you the Holy Spirit than if I stayed here. Because the Holy Spirit's going to invade your life. He's only going to tell you the truth. He's going to tell you the truth about me. You won't know the truth about me without the Holy Spirit. And by the way, he's just not going to teach you about me. He's never going to leave you. He's going to be your comforter and your counselor. He's going to be the one to call alongside. He should be your best friend. He didn't say that. I'm just saying he should be your best friend. And then to kick that all off, that when they got the Holy Spirit, on the day of resurrection, when Jesus had received the Holy Spirit, and he breathed on them in the upper room, it's the first thing he did with the disciples after the resurrection. Then you're 40 days later, and it's the ascension of Christ. It's the ascension. And as Jesus is going, he drops this on him. Oh, I forgot to tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, power. power. We're talking power. That word in the Greek is dunamis. It means dynamite. If I had a stick, I'd give it to you and say, watch what this does. And you say, I don't know about that. Well, drive out to Pantex and imagine what that would do. The Holy Spirit is power, is dynamite. Amen. He's not a little flickering candle. He's not a, well, just kind of, he, he's dynamite. And you say, well, why do we need that? To be overcomers, to be a witness. I already know when I say that, you say, well, you don't know where I work and everybody's mad at me and all that kind of stuff. Well, you don't know the Holy Spirit. He'll only tell you the truth. And it's not just so you know the truth that you can go and be a truth teller to others. You say, I can't do that. I know you can't. That's why you need power. That's why you need the Holy Spirit. He can take an idiot like me and make me into a preacher. I don't want to do this. Not in my flesh, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, man. I'm sorry. I had to go into preacher for a little bit. It's something about the power. <laughs> You guys say, well, okay, I'll say power. <laughs> well, you don't cheer for the Cowboys that way. Especially when somebody runs over somebody, go, yeah. The Holy Spirit. By the way, we're not running over anybody. 
But can we just be honest? It takes, a, it takes a lot to even open up our mouth to our family or our neighbor. And, and everybody's depressed. Can I just say, you know, if, if you haven't figured this out, everybody lost on the election. Everybody. It, we are split right down the middle. It's 50-50. 50-50. Ain't nobody winning on this deal. It is a tug of war and both sides are pulling against you. And, and if we get caught in the middle of that, we got something greater. We got the gospel. I care about that. But you know what? The world? You want to talk about the world? You want to talk about what's going on in the world out there? I, I don't even know what to believe about it because everybody's lying. Amen. Who are you going to trust? Who are you gonna trust? I'll trust my Bible. I'll trust the Holy Spirit. I'll trust Jesus. Amen. And we are headed for a kingdom. This world's falling apart. Okay, I'm getting off track. I've got to watch my time. That, that was all extra on the word power. Okay, that's left there. Oh, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And, well, I thought they already had that. They had the Holy Spirit in them, but the Holy Spirit on them, two different things. Don't, don't ever be satisfied with just the Holy Spirit in you. That's really, really good. But there's the Holy Spirit on you. Okay, back to the sermon. Okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 1, 8. Remember, in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone in second service does not have the Spirit of Christ... He's not his. Something's going to happen, should have already started happening. As I go down through this sermon, you should be able to sense the Holy Spirit telling you like, amen, amen, that's, the, that's true, that's true, amen, the Holy Spirit's talking to you. If in case you're here and you say, I don't know about that, that just sounds really weird. Who's going to get, you know, well, it could be the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you. If the Holy Spirit doesn't live in you, uh, you're not saved. And the Holy Spirit will always confirm his word. So I'm not saying that, you know, you need to give me an A on the sermon. I'm saying the Holy Spirit knows how to tell you whether you're hearing the truth or not. Amen. In his word. So if I'm making it up or forcing verses together, then reject that. But if I'm just flat out telling you what it says... Quoting all these verses, by the way, most of those were from Jesus telling us about the Holy Spirit. It's true. And when I say that, you should have the truth inside, the spirit of truth going, that's it, that's it, that's it. Amen. Amen. And, and I'll tell you this, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you with power, you'll know it. You'll know it. You'll do things you never thought. <laughs> you'll stand up here and preach. And you're like, whoa. This is not just words. And if you're not hearing the Holy Spirit, something's drastically wrong. In Ephesians 1, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. He seals us. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's twice in Ephesians, sealed with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit. He's the down payment. I'm, I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ephesians 5:18. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit upon you, the Holy Spirit in control of you. We don't want to be controlled by alcohol or drugs. I want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't happen automatically. I have to give myself to the Holy Spirit, even though I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit upon me. Well, that's a sermon. I'm glad you guys were here. No, you, you need to know all that because everybody's lying to us. That's true. But the Holy Spirit's never going to lie to us. So then when it comes down, okay, here's the warning. Look at the warning that we have. We know the resource we have with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. But look at the warning, chapter 4, verse 1. The warning, beloved, beloved. Do not believe every spirit. Don't believe. Here's the warning. Don't believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God. There's a way you have to test the spirits. Because many, many false prophets have gone out into the world. That's true then. That's true today. They went out from the church. They've gone out. They come up with a different gospel. They come up with a different definition of Jesus. The Holy Spirit's number one job is to teach you the right doctrine, the right truth about Jesus. The false prophets 
under the Antichrist influence, the devil's influence, if they can change anything about your definition of Jesus from what the Word of God says, they got you. That's, that's why when somebody says, hey, I just believe in Jesus. Well, let's define Jesus as the Word of God defines him. Because a lot of people out there can say, well, Jesus, I think is this. I just want the real Jesus, you know, and the Bible's not the real Jesus. The real Jesus or the, the little God that became a God or the, just the prophet or what, what is the... What is the biblical Jesus? See, the Spirit of God wants you to know by the Holy Spirit the biblical Jesus that you have a connection, a relationship to, that you believe in. That's why, notice what he says. Okay, here's the warning. The, we want to make sure that we understand Jesus Christ as God. The warning, don't believe every spirit, but test every spirit, excuse me. But now we have the Spirit of God or Antichrist. Is it the Spirit of God or the Antichrist? That's, a very, that's what he covers in verses 2 or 3. Is it the Spirit of God or the Antichrist? By this you know, verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Can I hear you say Spirit of God? Spirit. He starts with the good news first. By this you can know it's the Spirit of God. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit Every pastor or servant or person or prophet or politician or whatever, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Amen. You say, well, everybody believes that. No, they don't. They don't. Do you, do you see what that's saying? Every spirit that confesses. Okay, I'm a spirit right now. Okay. I'm, I'm the spirit of Pastor Bill, and I'm confessing to you, I'm confessing to you that Jesus, okay, that's Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, God, has come in the flesh. You say, what is that? Christmas. Amen. You need to know, I believe in the biblical Holy Spirit-filled Christmas story. Amen. Every word of it. Amen. Every word of it. Not my culture, not my religion, not my tradition. I believe every word that Jesus the Christ became flesh, the incarnation of God. Amen. You say, what does that mean? That means God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, has to become a man. What the Christmas story is, this amazing thing that God became a man. That's crazy. Why would God have to become a man? Not to give us a Hallmark Christmas card. No, no, no. To give us, he, he's headed for the cross because he loves you. God can't die, but the God man can die and take your sin, face every temptation you faced, pay your price. God became like you. Perfect. In the flesh. Not a ghost, not a maybe. God, he didn't lay aside his deity, his glory. He did, he did not lay aside his deity. That was God dying for you, and yet it was man. Jesus is the God-man. And right away we start doing the math on that. Don't do the math. Listen to your Bible. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Understand what your Bible's trying to tell you. Because then you see the false prophets... The spirit of Antichrist comes along and they mess with that biblical truth. You know what I'm saying to you is biblical truth, right? Started in the Old Testament. A virgin. I believe in a virgin. So I think she was like 14, 15, 16 years old. Well, how'd you get pregnant? The Holy Spirit Amen. came over her. And the Christ child was planted in her. The Christ that's been around forever. God himself became a man. Amen. Jesus was born. I believe it. You need to know that a lot of people think that's just a fable. Yeah. Well, now we know. That's not really what happened. Get away from me, you spirit of Antichrist. Well, you don't take the Bible literally. Yeah. I do. Yeah. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, I do. Well, you don't under, I, I've told you, I don't understand all of it. I believe all of it. So all of that to say, I'm just what does that look like? I believe the Christmas story. Literally. We're about to celebrate that, by the way. Woo! Why should we? Because it's true. Um, I believe the Easter story. 
The dead come back to life. Yes. I believe the kingdom story. I can't wait to get the kingdom story. Said, you know, until then, I got the kingdom here. So I'm just sharing with you. I believe the Bible. And when I say that, you know, it's the Holy Spirit. I'm not making it up. I mean, when you're not even in my little secret place, I'm just there with my Bible, and the Holy Spirit talks to me. And you say, how? He talks to me with the Word of God. And I see Jesus in ways I've never seen him before. I, I love him. He loves me. It, okay, I go back to where I was. Where was I? Okay, the warning, the warning, the warning. Uh, what do, how do we know the difference? Well, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ is God. And yet he's human. You see, the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist, verse 3, and every spirit, every other spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. Well, he wasn't really in the flesh. Yes, he was. Well, he wasn't really God. Yes, he was. Well, he wasn't really a man. Yes, he was. So he was 50-50. No, he wasn't. He was 100% God. He's 100% man. Well, you can't have 200%. Don't tell God. Matter of fact, quantum physics is figuring out there could be a lot more answers than you think there are answers. There are. Your Bible just makes it very clear. And so anytime somebody comes and says, well, you know, he wasn't really God. He was a little G. Mm. Or if they come and say, well, it wasn't really a man. It was like a ghost that kind of looked like a man. Mm. Or he was a man that became a God, and then the God left him be before he got crucified. Because, mm. nope, that doesn't compute. And they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're coming up with new definitions trying to explain God, man, Christmas. When I was in th theology proper way back in Bible college, we actually addressed this. It's called the hypostatic union, the hypostatic union, which is basically how can you be 100% God, 100% man, human, at the same time? And it never goes away. Um, I'm going to read for you. Uh, Got Questions, by the way. Got Questions, a great site. I, I trust them for the most part. I haven't found anything so far that I disagree with. Some of them, I know the guy's writing this. But Got Questions, here's how they explain the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is a term used to describe how God the Son, Jesus Christ, took on a human nature yet remained fully God at the same time. Jesus always had been God, but at the incarnation, Jesus became a human being. In addition, in addition of the human nature to the divine nature is Jesus, the God-man. This is the hypostatic union. Jesus Christ, one person, fully God and fully man. Jesus' two natures, human and divine, are inseparable. Jesus will forever be the God-man, fully God, fully human, two distinct natures in one person. Jesus' humanity and divinity are not mixed, but are united without loss of separate identity. Jesus has two natures, but one personality. The doctrine of the hypostatic union is an attempt to explain how Jesus could be both God and man at the same time. It is ultimately, though, a doctrine we are incapable of fully understanding. It is impossible for us to fully understand how God works. We, as human beings, are with infinite, human beings with infinite minds. Not infinite, finite minds. Let me say it again. We, as human beings, with finite minds, should not expect to totally comprehend an infinite God. Jesus is both God and man. 
Jesus has always been God, but he did not become a human being until he was conceived by Mary. Jesus became a human being in order to identify with us in our struggles, and more importantly, so that he could die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins. In summary, the hypostatic union teaches that Jesus is both fully human and fully divine, that there is no mixture of either nature, and that he is one united person forever. Amen. God, man, in your place. Can I see John Corson? If a teaching, suggestion, or thought is of the Spirit of God, it will affirm both the deity and humanity of Christ. The question in the early church was never concerned about the deity of Christ. The de debate was over his humanity. Church councils would convene with, with, in the second century and argue vehemently over this issue because the Gnostics thought had pen uh, penetrated the church. 2,000 years later today, however, it is the deity of Christ that is continually called into question. John says the Spirit of God attests to both the humanity and the deity of Christ. Such is the test by which we recognize him. So the Gnostics were going around like, well, he wasn't in the flesh. He wasn't real. It just He appeared that way. No, his body, his blood, the God-man died for you. Don't mess with that definition. Today, it's more about his deity. Well, Jesus is a great prophet. No, he is the prophet who is God. Well, no, he's the brother of Lucifer. He is not the brother of Lucifer. He created that archangel at the very beginning when he was a holy angel and fell. Don't make my Jesus a brother of any angel, let alone Lucifer. Well, he was a little God and kind of got grown up to a bigger little God. Listen, my Jesus is God who became a man, who died in my place, and those two natures are held in one person. And here it blows my mind. He still carries that into the future. And if you listen to somebody telling you different, by the way, I just addressed the Mormons, the Jehovah Witnesses, and the Muslims all in one statement. Because they all believe in Jesus, but not the Son of God, not the deity of God, and not the humanity of God. They adjust it to make it more appealing. Now, I'll just take the real Jesus, nothing but the real Jesus, the biblical Jesus with the word of God and with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And by the way, if you're working with a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness or a Muslim, then we're trying to manifest to them the truth. I actually feel sorry for him because you only got half of Jesus. He's not that half. He's the whole Jesus. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? You say, well, what does that have to do with me? Everything, you're an overcomer. You should already know this. You can test. Matter of fact, you can test me right now. Did I, am I a spirit that just gave you the spirit of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the Lord Jesus? Did I tell you the truth, or did I try to trick you? Did I try to water something down, or did I try to build something? Or was that just, did I walk through the path, did I tell you the truth? And some of you might look at your Bible and make sure I told you, but I think I told you the truth. That's what it says. But why should we care? Well, one is to make sure you know the truth, right? That you're in the truth, and the truth's in you. But remember, the whole point of this, all of this is so that you're an overcomer. You're supposed to be an overcomer. Matter of fact, all of that, in one sense, is introduction to get you to the point. We're overcomers. Verses 4 through 6. You are of God, little children. Isn't that great? In the Greek, that you there would be like, you! I've been talking about false prophets and spirit of Antichrist, all those spirit of error. I've been talking about them. But you, he's talking to the church. But you, aren't you glad you're a you? But you, little children, you're, you're of God. 
have overcome them. Who's the them? That's the false prophets. You are of God, little children, have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. So often we get intimidated by this or that thoughts and then we start getting all convoluted in our brain. And, and the Holy Spirit just, I just want to know the truth. He'll say, just study the Gospel of John. Read the Gospels. Read your New Testament. And the Spirit of Christ comes and tells us. And then we get to be like, well, wait, 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 wait. I, I can be an overcomer. I can be victorious. I can live that way. I can live in a world where I'm not supposed to exist. But somehow with, with the pressure of the Holy Spirit, somehow with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, somehow with the word of God, that I can be a part of the you and not a part of the they, or them. I have a question. How does Bigfoot survive at the bottom of the ocean? Can I, can I see that picture again? Now, wait a minute. He looks kind of happy for a crab. Matter of fact, he looks kind of fluffy for a crab. If I was going to have a pet crab, I'd want that one. A Yeti crab. But now, wait a minute. Did I tell you that he lives... 37,000 feet at the bottom of the ocean. What he faces is a thousand times more atmospheric pressure than you. What about Dumbo? Can I see Dumbo again? I didn't give Dumbo the name. The scientist did. That's Dumbo. Dumbo looks like, how, how can he stand the pressure? How, how can he overcome the depths? We can't do that. What about the deep sea jellyfish? That looks so delicate, like fragile. And you're telling me if we went to, you'd be a golf ball. Boom, you would implode. Well, how, how do they do that? How do we even know that's true? Well, we had to build a submarine. And so we built a submarine. Can I see it? It's well fortified. It's intact. It's like a little fortress. And so we, in our 15 pounds per square inch, we have to get into that thing. And then it goes to the bottom. I would never want to do this, by the way. But anyway, it goes to the bottom of the earth. And then it finds. But if we're not protected. But I have a question. How, how does the jellyfish, how does Bigfoot, how do they do it? Did you know? They're pressurized for where they live. They're pressurized for where they live. That jellyfish, that Bigfoot crab, that Dumbo, the octopus, you see, inside of them, it's 17,000 pounds of pressure to equal the pressure on the outside. If I said this, they're overcomers because of the pressure where they live. I, I don't know the pressure of your marriage. I don't. I, I don't know if it's, you know, 50 pounds of pressure or 1,000 or 16,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. Amen. I don't know where you work. I don't know whether it's a glorious job or like they treat me like I'm garbage. And I don't know the pressure when they all get together and coffee break and you're the butt of all their jokes. I don't know that pressure, but the Holy Spirit does. I don't know what it's like when you go back to school and everybody there is spouting all this stuff scientifically and you're mocked at and laughed at for believing in God, I don't know that pressure that you face, but the Holy Spirit does. Did you know the Holy Spirit is personal? Did you know the Holy Spirit is your best friend? Did you know you can go to any depths or heights 
with the Holy Spirit. He'll say, I got you back. I'll give you the right pressure so that you don't implode or explode. You can be a witness of Jesus right where I put you. Greater is he who is in you than anything, than he who's in the world. Anyone, anything. I don't care if you're talking about the Antichrist, the devil, all the liars, put them all in one basket, everybody. He who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. It's really pretty simple. If you believe in Jesus, he's the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. It was Jesus that promised you the Holy Spirit of truth. Not, not to trick you or not that you have to pass some kind of test to figure it out. He's just going to give you the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit's there ready for every day when you say, fill me, use me, help me. I can't take the pressure. I can't take it. And the Holy Spirit has a way of pressurizing you where you live to where like Dumbo you don't even know it it's just like whoa look at they're taking our picture <laughs> and the jellyfish is just floating through doesn't even know about all the pressure and the yeti crab's going Bigfoot's pretty cool with me See, I'm just, you know it's not as complicated as we make it out to be Jesus the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Plus, we got one another. We got us. By the way, the last point, just, and this is the last point. He talked about you, you emphasized in the Greek. They, verse 5, they are of the world. The false prophets, all these prophets of error, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world. The world hears them. The world hears them. The world hears them, and it does. We, notice the change of pronouns. It went from you to they, we. That's also emphasized in the Greek. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. I want to know who's the we, who's the us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth in the spirit of error. Who's the we? Well, it includes John. We learned from chapter 1. It's the apostles. It's the apostles. It's the ones that are writing this book. Can I see boys real quick? If this were a mere individual talking, John, the claim would be presumptuous. But it is not. This is one of the apostles citing the collective testimony of all the apostles and making that testimony the measure of truth and sound doctrine. Remember, John's one of the last one writing the epistle. You have a Bible. Where did that Bible come from? The original apostles, where the Holy Spirit breathed on them as they wrote that. You have the truth right here. And something happens for overcomers. When the overcomers hear the word of God written by the apostles, when you hear the Bible, you know it's true. You know it's true. That's exactly what he's saying here. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. They hear the apostles. They hear the word of God. He who is not of God does not hear the word of God. They don't hear the apostles. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Oh, you see, there's a threefold. You got Jesus. You have the Holy Spirit. You have the word of God. And let me tell you, in this room right here, and then you throw on internet right now, and we really are on 77 stations right now across the country, across the country. But I know one of two things is, you know, 
If you hear the word, you hear First John, you hear it, you, hear, you understand it, the Holy Spirit's going, yes, that's it. It's your Bible. It's Jesus. It's me. If you get that, you're of God. You're of God. Little children, hey, pressurize. Oh, but if you're going like, I don't get this. I don't know what you're talking about. That book's ancient. doesn't make any sense. A bunch of fables, you know, and then people gave their thoughts. And You hear the world. You hear false prophets. God's children know Jesus. They know the Holy Spirit. And they know their Bibles. They love Jesus. They love the Holy Spirit. And they love the Bible. That's the truth. So while I've been preaching, the Holy Spirit's been saying, talking to you a little bit. And uh, you should have heard the Holy Spirit going like, amen, amen, that's true, that's true. And, you know, feel that like amen from the Holy Spirit. Uh, if in case you sat there and go, I got nothing. I just got questions. I think you're kind of an idiot. Well, I am an idiot. But if you got nothing from the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm not judging you. I can only judge one person in the room, me. I can only judge me. I heard the word of God. I heard the apostles. I heard the Holy Spirit. John Corson says it like this. Last quote, we're done. In this simple section, John has told us all we need to know to identify, to identify the cultist. That is, if a person draws people closer to God, if a pastor or a person draws us closer to God, if he embraces both the deity and the humanity of Jesus Christ, if he encourages folks to read the scriptures, read your Bible, he is of the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, if he diminishes either the deity or the humanity of Christ, if he makes people feel distant from God, or if he makes light of the word, the Bible, that guy's in error. It's that simple. Amen, Grace Church? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have a Bible written and preserved for us and a Holy Spirit that comes along and gives us illumination, application, that we can understand it. Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. As we're still being taught, Lord, as we're still growing in your grace, we thank you for grace upon grace upon grace that while we're still yet sinners, Christ died for us. And whosoever will can get saved. And I thank you, Lord, that the evidence of that salvation is your Holy Spirit sealing us, the Holy Spirit speaking to us, the Holy Spirit confirming your word. And then the Holy Spirit empowering us, pressurizing us for those circumstances and places where we live, that we might represent you. So thank you, Father, that there's a reason for us to be here on planet Earth. Thank you that we get to look forward to the kingdom, but we get to represent you till then. Thank you that we get to go into many different places, pressurized, empowered to be overcomers. But perhaps you're here today and, boy, you got nothing. Instead, you have, like God's telling you that you need Jesus. Or the Holy Spirit's convicting you that you're not saved. The purpose of the sermon wasn't to create that. It was to actually confirm overcomers. Unless you don't know Jesus, then you're still part of the world. It might be that Jesus is like calling you by name right now. The Holy Spirit's talking to you and you have this chance. Like right now, right now you have a chance to say yes to Jesus. I know you don't understand everything. I, I don't either. But I do know that Jesus is the truth. I know the Holy Spirit's the truth. And the Bible I just shared with you was nothing but the truth. But you do have to receive it. If you're here this morning and you want to receive Christ, you want to believe in Christ, you want to sit down in Christ, I'm going to ask you to stand just to give us a chance to pray for you. If you're here this morning, and you want to be a Christian, you want to say yes to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to stand. Is there anybody right now? Before we close with this last song.
Father, thank you for your word. I pray for all those people listening right now. All those people watching, pray for the ones in the room. I pray that we would be of the truth. The Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, your word. Thank you, Lord. Let us go out of here pressurized for another week. We thank you. We love you. You deserve all the glory. And all of God's people would say, love you guys.